is one of the most glorious times of the year because we celebrate God coming to earth. I, I mean, to really think about it, it's phenomenal. The God who is so powerful that the way he created this earth is he spoke it. That's how he created and then he decided he would limit himself and take on the form of us, his creation, and live among us and show us how to live and then die for us. And his life here was glorious. And we now celebrate that glory. And here's the thing, and here's what I want to focus on. God calls us to be a part of that glory. God calls every one of us to be a part of that glory. And there's something within all of us that desires to be a part of something glorious. But here's the thing. If we don't understand what true glory looks like, what God's glory looks like, what we will find is we will find ourselves chasing things that look like glory, but they're not really glorious. Um, I feel like I experienced a, a lot of this uh, this past week uh, or two weeks ago when some friends and I and my wife spent some time in Vegas, okay? And I talked about how, um, you know, we were in the presence of people that our uh, culture just worships. Uh, and there was one individual in particular that we sat right next to. Um, we were sitting in the second row of this concert and right in front of me was someone that most of you may not know, but in the cowboy world, he's one of the most famous men to ever live because he's one of the most successful cowboys there ever was. And throughout this concert, I would watch people recognize him and they would come up and they would want to get a selfie with him. Now, why do we want to give it a selfie with somebody famous? Because we think that that's going to somehow attach us to them uh, and we can show our friends and it's going to bring us some glory, right? People are going to go, wow, you were right next to so-and-so. That's amazing. Why do we do that? Well, the reason we do that is because we're actually created for glory. But it's God's glory that we're created for. There's a hunger in us that desires that, that God has actually put in us. But if we don't meet it through God, what we do is we find ourselves chasing it in other ways. We want to talk about our achievements. We want to talk about something we've done, someone we've been close to, you know, the animal that we hunted, whatever it is. We, we desire some kind of glory. Now the thing is, is that again, it's not bad. God's put it in there, but we want to focus it where it needs to go. I want to look this morning at somebody specific, Mary, the mother of Jesus that God shared his glory with. And the reason I want to do it is because of this. Because again, God has called every one of us to share in his glory. It wasn't just Mary. It's all of us. We all have a role. But here's the thing. Understanding what that glory looks like will help us walk in it and be a part of it instead of chasing things that only have the appearance of glory, but are not really glorious. You know, one of the things that we were able to enjoy while we were there in Vegas is they had amazing decorations. I mean, amazing. Um, you know, we've got some ornaments here. You can see some up there. I mean, they had ornaments, no offense, as big as Trevor, okay? <laughs> <laughs> bigger they had huge ornaments I mean it just there was all kind I mean it was just amazing to see um, the architecture and and all that was there and it was really neat to observe and be a part of but one of the things that I thought about as I was observing that is I thought you know what most of the people here are not really able to enjoy what I'm enjoying right now 
even though it's right in front of them. And the reason they're not able to enjoy it is because most of them are high on something. Most of them are hungover from something. Most of them are stressed out from the money that they lost last night and they're wondering if they're going to be able to recoup it. You see what I'm saying? They're in the midst of something that has a glorious appearance, but they're not really able to enjoy it because they're pursuing glory in places where it's not really found. They're pursuing a fulfillment and an enjoyment in places that it's not really found. And it was no different in the time of Mary, in the time when Jesus was born. There were people pursuing glory, and most of them missed Jesus, God in the flesh, because they didn't know what to look for. I want to look this morning in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. It's the Christmas story. And before this, an angel had appeared to Mary and told her what God was asking of her, and she said yes to it. And I want you to think about this for a moment. I mean, just think about an angel appearing to you, okay, and saying, I want you to play a special role in God's plan for history. And again, the thing is, is He's asking that of you, every one of us, okay? But Mary had a special role. An angel appeared to her and said, I want you to participate in this. And she said yes. Now, after an angel appears to you and says, I want you to play a special role, what do you think your life is going to look like after that? I mean, isn't it going to be glorious I mean, when you walk into a room, I mean, red carpets are suddenly going to roll out in front of you, right? I mean, people are going to be like, oh, wow, it's really Phyllis. She's here. God's anointed. I mean, isn't that what life is going to look like when God says to you, I want you to play a special role? Well, we don't have to wonder. Because we have the story of Mary, and that's exactly what happened to her. So let's see what happened after an angel appeared to her and said, you're going to play a special role in all of history, and you're going to carry God inside of you. Well, here's what happened. Verse 1 of chapter 2 of Luke says, At that time the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Okay, so I want to stop right there. And I've just read some words that maybe you blanked out and you're like, okay, I don't really know what's going on. So let's break this down. Here's what happened, okay? Again, going back, an angel has appeared to Mary. You're going to play, play a special part. Um, God, you are going to carry God, okay? Now here's what happens. She is eight months pregnant. She's over eight months pregnant. She, based on the timeline that we're given and knowing when she's going to give birth, she is just about 10 days or so away from giving birth. Now, for you ladies who've been in that place, I want you to take yourself back there for a moment. And I want you to remember how you felt. Do I know how you felt? No, I don't. But I sure know how my wife acted during that time. And it was great, by the way. That's what I'm saying. She acted great. But behind the great way she was acting, I could tell behind, you know, the glory that was her, there was some suffering going on. I could tell because I'm perceptive like that. Okay, at this time, Mary's probably swollen, okay? Her ankles, her feet are probably swollen. 
based on what many of you have expressed during this time, you're just thinking, get this thing out of me. I am so tired of this. This can't go on any longer. I am ready for this to be over. So that's how you're feeling. And your husband comes to you and says, oh, by the way, we've been given instructions by our government that we have to leave now and we have to travel 90 miles. Oh, and by the way, vehicles haven't been invented yet. So you will be walking. You might have a donkey. So you are about 10 days away from delivery. You're feeling terrible. And you must now travel 90 miles pregnant and miserable. How glorious are you feeling at this moment? You see what I'm saying? But yet, she was living in the presence of glory. She was a part of something that was absolutely glorious. But in that moment, I guarantee you, it did not feel the way that most of us perceive glory to be. And so she traveled. And by the way, she uh, was traveling through a climate, uh, a desert climate that was getting extremely cold at night. To travel that 90 miles um, probably took over a week, especially for a pregnant woman walking and riding a donkey, which I'm sure she did both. I mean, if you've ever ridden an animal, uh, you know, it's not that comfortable, okay? There's a reason that cowboys walk the way that they do, okay? <laughs> imagine doing this while you're pregnant. I can't imagine, okay? But she makes it. She makes it to Bethlehem, okay? She has endured. Now, after you've endured all that, again, you are carrying God in the flesh. Can you turn that fan on? Surely, God is going to roll out the red carpet once you get there, right? I mean, you've endured all this. God has something special for you at Bethlehem because you're about to give birth to the God of the universe. Verse 6. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, she wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in an animal trough because there was no lodging for them. So they get to the town and because of the census and everybody going back to this small town, okay, imagine for a second that, you know, there's a census called here in the U.S., and everyone that was born here in Cesar had to come back. We don't have the lodging for that. I mean, that's what happened here. All of a sudden, poof. So they get there. After all this travel, she just wants to be done with it, and there's no place for them to stay. So they stay among the animals. Now, we don't really know where they stayed, okay? We don't know if it was in the actual stable uh, with the donkeys or whether it was off in a cave somewhere where there were some other animals. Because again, they're not ready for everybody and all the animals that come in. But we know that she was basically staying among animals. At night... You're tired, you're exhausted, you're in pain, and now you're sleeping among the animals. I want you to think about this. Because for all of us who have been called to something glorious as participating in the things of God, there have been times in your life where you're looking around your environment and you're going, man, I really thought God was going to use me. I really thought God was calling something, me into something special. But I look around and all I see is donkeys around me. That's what Mary was doing. And the smells that were going on. And then as she gives birth 
to God in the flesh, she has to put him in an animal trough. I mean, the scripture doesn't talk about this, but man, if I'm Mary, I'm sitting there and I'm wondering, did I really hear from an angel? Is this really even true? I mean, this doesn't make sense at all. But it doesn't make sense to the world because we don't really understand what glory is. And we're going to get into that, but I want to read some more verses first. In verse 8 it says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them. All right, now we're getting into something glorious. And the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in an animal trough. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Now when you read this, that's amazing. I mean, you've got an angel appearing, and the angel isn't described, but we know that the shepherds, their reaction is, they're terrified. So this must be something very powerful that is before them. But it doesn't stop there. It says the host of heaven join in, and all of a sudden they start singing and proclaiming the praises of God. This is amazing. But... This isn't in front of Mary. This isn't in front of Joseph. This isn't even in front of the people that Mary and Joseph are among. This is out away from town in some far off field for some shepherds. Now, shepherds of that time were seen as the lowliest people. The people who were shepherds were the people who basically had nothing else to give. Uh, they were the lowliest. Shepherding was for the youngest in the family, or the hireling, or the slave. Shepherds stayed out in the field, and they stunk. They stunk. People didn't want to be around them. Matter of fact, for those of you who know uh, the account of Egypt, Egypt didn't want the shepherds anywhere around them. They, they wanted them way off away from them. Because shepherds are not seen as anything glorious, and yet God chooses to appear to them. Let's keep going. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. First of all, God honors these shepherds, okay? And throughout Scripture, you see God honoring shepherds and you see God honoring people that the rest of the world says they don't deserve any glory. I mean, when you look at King David, when God anointed him, he was a shepherd. That's who he was. The rest of the world said, you're a nobody, go out and watch the sheep. God used Moses 
God used Moses in one of the most powerful ways of anybody in human history. When God called him, what was he doing? He was watching sheep. When God is born in the flesh, what does he do? He announces it to shepherds. Why? I think it has something to do with the fact that these guys were not pursuing false glory that we see all around us. You see, there are people all around us, again, they're, they're chasing any kind of glory that can, they can get. And they're not looking for the real thing. These guys weren't. These guys were just making a living, watching sheep, and nobody was praying them, praising them and saying, wow, that's so awesome that you go out and sit around and watch sheep. You know, they're not doing that. Can I get your autograph? Can I get a selfie with you? Nobody's doing that. Nobody's saying, oh, hey, I ran into Bill, the guy who washes the sheep out there. Can you believe that? Oh, yeah, we talked for an hour or so. It was great. Nobody says that. Those are the people that God is looking for. Now, the other thing I want you to see is this. Mary understood that she was in the middle of something glorious. She, you hear that she stores all these things up in her heart. But she could have taken the other view. She could have been like, really, God? You just displayed yourself in this amazing way to these shepherds, okay? I'm in here among the stink of the donkeys, and now you bring them in. We got more stink coming in. And they're telling me about this great thing that you've done for them. It would be easy for her to go, gee, this doesn't feel very glorious. But she chose the opposite, and because of that, God used her in a powerful way. There's something I want you to hear. Many times, when God is using us for something glorious, those around us don't recognize it. And oftentimes, they will criticize us and not understand what God is doing. I want you to hear that, okay? Not only um, did that happen here, but it, it, it happens all around us. I, re, I was reminded of it um, several weeks ago. I had the opportunity to go with Stetson to uh, the fourth grade class trip to see Lincoln's tomb and all that stuff. And it was so interesting. I, I know that when I was a kid, I was taken on something like that but I have no idea what it was. I mean, all I cared about that time was, you know, punching people and, you know, eating lunch. And I had no idea what was going on. But as an adult, I was like, wow. You know, and one of the things that I've observed now is, I mean, we honor Lincoln, President Lincoln, like crazy. I mean, if President Lincoln, you know, ate lunch in your county, you've got a sign up somewhere that President Lincoln once ate lunch here. I mean, the guy is honored beyond belief. But here's the thing. One of the things that I learned while I was there, and I was uh, reading old newspapers, and reading old comic strips, and reading opinions uh, from the peers of Lincoln, is that nobody, nobody really believed in him. Everybody criticized him. People either thought that he was supporting the slaves too much and saw them as their enemy, or they thought that he wasn't doing enough. I mean, as I read the comic strips, they demeaned him like crazy. And, I, and when you look at his personal life and all that was going on with his wife and his kids and the death, I mean... As I tried to put myself in his shoes, he must have felt like the whole world was against him and that his life was meaningless. But yet, God was using him. He was using him to accomplish something. And you see it over and over again. When God is doing something, the world doesn't get it. If the world gets what God is doing in you, that's not a good sign. 
if they're for what God is doing in you, that's probably not a good sign. You see what I'm saying? Because what Scripture teaches is that the world is against God. So if the world likes you <laughs> and wants to lift you up, there's a problem. And so here's what I want to share. When you look at the title, God, Glory Isn't Always. Well, number one, glory isn't always popular. I mean, when we think of something glorious, we think of something that's popular, right? But think about it. Think about even Christmas itself and the Christmas celebration. The Christmas celebration is centered around Jesus, the one who, you know, again, gave up heaven, came to live among us. But he, even that is not really popular. Because when you think about the Christmas season, if you listen to the songs and you know, the things that are around us as you go about stores and so on, Jesus isn't the center of it. Jesus is not what you hear about. Jesus is not the popular thing to talk about in Christmas. I mean, it's kind of odd, okay? You've got to be forceful to talk about Jesus. We'll talk about all kinds of other things you know, around, but we won't talk about Jesus. If you want to be a part of God's glory, don't expect to be in the midst of something that's popular. Mary, was she a part of anything that was popular? Absolutely not. The people around her didn't see her as anything special at all. They saw her as some kind of poor, you know, loon. I'm sure people talked to her like, oh, God bless you, sweetie. They didn't see her as anything special. But yet she was a part of God's glory that people would later see. Another thing that we often think is that we think being a part of something glorious is going to be easy, right? It's going to be easy. What about the glory that Mary experienced was easy? There was nothing easy about it. It was actually the opposite. It was hard. But you know what God did? God gave her the grace to not only walk through it, but to share in the glory in the midst of it. So just because your path is hard, don't be thinking to yourself, well, you know, I'm not a part of anything special. No, not necessarily. Just because you're not, not a part of something popular, just because you're not a part of something easy, just because you're not a part of something prestigious. Again, you know, she was out in a stable. Is that prestigious? No, not at all. But is she being used of the Lord in a very powerful way? But you know what? During her lifetime, there were people all around her that were in very prestigious positions, okay? And they claimed to be like this with God. And they were given all kinds of honor, and they wore long flowing robes, and everywhere they went, people honored them as being holy and righteous and next to God. And they looked at Mary and thought, huh, yeah, she says the Holy Spirit came on her. Sure it did. No, it wasn't prestigious, it wasn't popular, and it wasn't easy. And last of all, and they, they all connect, but it wasn't comfortable. Being in the midst of God's glory doesn't mean that you're going to be comfortable. I mean, right now, this is very comfortable. We're warm, and yet I've got a fan going so I don't sweat too much while I'm sharing God's word. We've got nice decorations around us. And it's pleasant. Is this not pleasant? Is this not nice? It is. But you know what? In two weeks, my wife and I are going to be heading to India. One of the dirtiest places in the world. Because I've been there. And it's dirty. And it's poor. And even when you're in some place nice, it's still nasty. It just is. Why would I do that? Because it's in those places that I've experienced the glory of the Lord 
more so than I ever have in the comfort of what I live in here. And it's worth it. And so I just want to encourage you and I want to remind you that God is inviting you into his glory and he wants to use you in powerful ways, but you must say yes. And when you say yes, understand it doesn't mean it's going to be comfortable. It doesn't mean it's going to be prestigious. It's not going to be popular and it's not going to be easy, but it is going to be full of glory and full of joy and full of something that this world can't produce. God's inviting you into it. Whatever your part is, I don't know what it is, but whatever he's inviting you into, I just want to encourage you to say yes to it. It's worth it. Father, thank you that you call us into your glory. And Lord, thank you that we have the hope that someday, someday, heaven's going to come to earth. Someday we're going to be a part of amazing things that right now we're, we're shielded from fully seeing. And I, I pray, Lord, that you would protect our hearts from pursuing artificial things here on earth that really are just a, a shadow of, of what is real. Help us to pursue the real glory that is you, Lord, that only comes from you because that's what you've created us for. Your word says, Lord, that we're created in your image. <laughs> and Lord, you are glorious. And so I just pray that for each one, they would not be deceived and they would not pursue things that will not fill them, but instead they would pursue your glory, Lord, to be used of you, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's not popular, even when it's not easy, and even when it's not prestigious, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you call us into your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.